the thing is, I have seen more cop rock. There's a subplot about child selling, and if you're wondering, does the child seller sing? Yup. I'm the baby merchant. Tots are us. I give you all the service and no damn fuss. Give the baby merchant just a week or two. I'll have your baby for you. So imagine. It's September 26, 1990. Bon Jovi's blaze of glory is at the top of the charts. Cold War tensions are easing after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And you're one of the millions of Americans tuning in to ABC's latest fall lineup to watch the new series they're bringing on this season. Overall, it's a pretty average selection, with a smattering of family sitcoms and a police procedural to keep things lively. Nothing too outstanding. But one show in particular stands out. A high-concept musical drama titled Cop Rock has been all the buzz since the promo started airing the past few weeks, with late-night hosts like David Letterman hyping it up the days leading up to the first episode. So, the other one... Okay. The other one is Cop Rock, which uh, starts tomorrow. Oh, I want it to do so well. I'm excited about that show, oh, too. Oh, how can you not be? It's, it's a half-hour show about cops, and it's a musical. So there'd be cops... Well, welcome to Neptune. That's right, it's a musical. Uh -huh. yeah. Unbeknownst to you, however, you are going to be privileged to witness television history. Hey, the sunshine. Tears and rain. I'll be honest, up until a few weeks ago, I had never heard of Cop Rock, and then this was brought to my attention. That's when I halted everything I was doing, tossed whatever I was researching out the window, and immediately started looking up whatever this was, because I needed to know. And frankly, it didn't disappoint. Sometimes all you need to hear is the elevator pitch for a project to know it's going to flop but it's another to see it belly flop into the pool and sink to the bottom over the course of months. From being built up as the next big thing from a highly regarded television producer to the butt of the joke on late night TV for the rest of the decade. Canceled. But you know the problem with cop rock? What was that? So, uh, too much cop, not enough rock. Not enough rock. <laughs> cop rock was such a bizarre concept, it left viewers and historians to wonder for years what coke-addled 80s TV executive greenlit it in the first place? That high clearly only lasted so long though, as halfway through the series airing, it was cancelled due to the terrible reception it was receiving. And let's be clear, it isn't too often you find a show too weird conceptually even for the 90s, where you're constantly oscillating between the legal proceedings of an extrajudicial police killing of a suspect and choreographed dance numbers about the struggles of the homeless. However, despite being regarded as one of the worst TV shows of all time, it's also slowly becoming a distant memory in pop culture, only mentioned in the rare occasional write-up or in vague passing as a punchline. TV never abused and insulted me, unless you count Cop Rock. Cop Rock. That sounds cool. Doesn't it? If it wasn't for the fact it somehow got a proper DVD release in 2016, Cop Rock very easily could have been the stuff of TV myth. Being a lesson for young television producers about the dangers of flying too close to the sun on wings of exclusivity contracts and Randy Newman show tunes. So hey, rather than talk about anything relevant happening or something people actually remember, let's take some time to dig into this bizarre piece of television history together and analyze one man's insane failed experiment in order to answer that ever important question of what the hell went wrong with Cop Rock? Well... <laughs> because you had, you had a police show, and there was gonna be rock and roll music every week, 
The police, the judge, the sheriff, the criminals would all sing maybe four or five new rock and roll songs every week. Yeah. To me, it has hit written all over it. So a cop rock musical. Honestly, considering we've seen theater productions on everything from Cats to SpongeBob SquarePants to a hip hop retelling of the life and times of Alexander Hamilton, a musical about the ongoings of a police department isn't the worst idea in terms of concept, the current political landscape notwithstanding, meaning the issues with cop rock came down to how it was handled. Enter TV producer Steve Bochco. I thought, well, this is it. This is going to be great. This is going to be as innovative as anything I've ever done. He's guilty, Judge. He's guilty. Now, the actual concept for Cop Raw came to Bochco in the 80s when he was supposedly approached about doing a Broadway adaptation of his police procedural series, Hill Street Blues, which he declined at the time. Fast forward a few years, and Bochco is dominating the TV doctor cop lawyer genre with shows like Hill Street Blues, LA Law, and eventually Doogie Howser MD. He was so successful, in fact, that ABC offered him a contract for a smooth $10 million to create 10 series for them. So in his infinite wisdom, after signing on with ABC, Stephen chose to test the limitations of that contract by revisiting the musical idea. I thought, well, you know, if I can't bring the cop show to Broadway, what if I brought Broadway to the cop show? Um, and why couldn't you do a dramatic musical? But like your one friend who got tricked into shilling for Herbalife, Steven was pretty much the only one going in with any real confidence about cop rock. Everyone from the cast to the composers involved knew instantly how this was gonna go down with how strange and out there this was. When Steven just pitched the show to Mike Post, his go-to composer for his previous series, Post simply responded, Don't. don't. <laughs> That's all I said. Don't. I said, don't. Why? I said, don't. You're going to ruin my life. You're going to get laughed off of television. Don't do it. He says, okay, I listened. I said, you're going to do it. He said, of course. I said, all right. Even future Disney emperor Bob Iger, who was head of ABC at the time, could have killed this project before it even got off the ground, considering he was apprehensive about it from moment one, and simply would have paid a minor penalty for voiding on their contract, especially when it was roughly costing a whopping $1.2 million an episode to produce. But Iger ultimately chose not to because of how invested Bochco was in the show. Due to the success of his previous works, Stephen was given the benefit of the doubt from everyone in regards to Cop Rock. To quote Scott D. Pierce from Deseret News, He's become such a power in Hollywood that he can do almost anything he wants. And as Cop Rock demonstrates, that kind of power can be dangerous. What everyone involved and watching seemed to immediately understand going in was that the conventions of gritty police procedural and campy Broadway musicals are so diametrically opposed that it would take the precision of Europe's finest watchmaker to fit it together smoothly. Unfortunately, Cop Rock was approached with the grace and tone deafness of a YouTuber apology video. From a police officer singing a somber country rock number as he's taken to prison to await his trial for murdering a suspect in cold blood, and then fading to Randy Newman's upbeat theme song where he plays the piano while surrounded by the cast members out of character, cheerfully bobbing their heads, Cop Rock was all over the map. It had intriguing police storylines that dealt with complex themes like racism and sexism in the police force, and the many flaws of law enforcement, including how officers are disincentivized to report their coworkers when they break the law themselves with how they're treated if they do, but was juxtaposing that with highly produced musical numbers about a plastic surgeon making people beautiful, and how he'll give you tasty cakes. And that's the fundamental issue at the heart of it. It didn't know what it should be. This could have been a weightier police drama that used original music to build on the emotion of the characters, like when Officer Rose sees his partner gunned down in front of him and then sings a tearful goodbye at his funeral, 
or it could have been the most decadent cheese the 90s ever produced, up there with when the WCW invaded Baywatch. The problem is that Steven circled answer C on his test sheet that read both, resulting in Cop Rock having the tonal consistency of this 50s jello recipe. And anyone who knows my channel is well aware that I can put up with a fluctuating tone. I'm a Yakuza and Devil May Cry fan. I legally have to be alright with that. So my issue is less about how flippant Cop Rock can be, and more that the tonal whiplash is equivalent to going 100 miles an hour in hot pursuit of John Doe from Seven, before crashing through a brick wall into your local theater's production of Mamma Mia. It might sound like I'm aggressively harping on this point, but there's no way I can emphasize harder how much it doesn't work in execution when it fundamentally had all the potential to. It's why when you have scenes dealing with weighty topics like victims of sexual assault or the way the homeless are treated in society, and in those same episodes, there's a John that's caught propositioning an undercover police officer singing about how he's fallen in love with her, both of whom were just now introduced, it's a real challenge not to think the show's punking you for taking it seriously. I wish my wife, oh, I wish she could understand, but she won't even lend me a helping hand. <laughs> now, this is where the majority of reviews of the show end. It's a tonal train wreck, Steven Bochco went mad with power, was this all an elaborate producer scheme, etc, etc. But I want to take this forensic analysis a couple steps further, because, well honestly all my friends are sick of me talking about Cop Rock and I need to vent my thoughts somewhere, but also the issues with the show run deeper than its concept alone. So let's start with the music production itself. Cop Rock will continue in a moment. Now credit where it's due, as much as I can take the piss out of it, the music for Cop Rock is actually pretty good. In places. Baby Merchant has become a bit of a meme song with how over the top it is in concept, and is usually the first thing I go to when I want to demonstrate what Cop Rock is to anyone who doesn't believe me, but it is a solid bop, and frustratingly catchy too. Listen to it a couple of times, and you'll catch yourself humming the lyrics I'm the baby merchant, tots are us, I give you all the service and no randomly while you're shopping for groceries, resulting in a lot of weird looks at checkout. Then you have the other side of the musical spectrum with emotional ballads that you can tell the singers putting their all into it, like Burning Crosses, Nowhere to Go, Nothing to Do, or You Lied. Also, keep in mind that none of these songs got a proper release with a track list, so these are names I'm using from the Cop Rock the Movie channel, which has all of them up if you want to check them out for yourself. Since Steven opted for creating original pieces for the show rather than doing a jukebox musical that used previously made songs, a la The Singing Detective or Glee, the score ends up really standing out, for better and for worse. And overall, the songs range anywhere from genuinely fantastic and work within the subject matter to flat out awful and offensively pointless, like having Bobby Glass from Popular sexually harassing her new partner via song. I wanna go But when you add them up, there's definitely more hits than misses, which is frankly respectable when you consider how much of a disaster the production was. To quote Mike Post, Cop Rock was the hardest thing I've done as a composer, because we were basically doing a mini Broadway show every week. As a starter, nearly every actor cast need to be able to sing, dance, and act, which for a weekly TV show is a lot to be asking for. And it's not just the main cast who need to be able to break out in show tunes either. Pretty much every actor down to one scene extras were used for the music. In the approximate 54 songs of the series, each main cast member only had one or two performances as the lead vocals, with a vast majority being handled by guest singers for one song. Which not only is a totally inefficient use of your characters in a musical, but also leads us in how the musical planning was actually handled or should I say mishandled. You see, there seemed to have been a five song stipulation with each episode, not counting the theme song, which admittedly isn't a terrible idea in terms of structure since it gave the songwriters a specific number to keep to. 
but like everything else with this show, the execution is where it falls apart, as that stipulation turned out to be more of a restriction than anything else. This feels to be the major reason why the pacings of the songs throughout each episode is completely whack. With five songs over the course of 45 minutes, you think there'd be a song every 10 minutes or so, approximately one each act. But sometimes an episode will go long stretches without any music, to the point you sort of forget about that aspect. So just as you're maybe getting pulled into the actual narrative happening, a Broadway dance number comes and smashes your head into the table. What's especially frustrating is there are plenty of times where you can see a song being played somewhere to emphasize a moment, but for whatever reason, they just don't. There's a particular trial scene where Detective Potts recounts all the harassment he's received after coming forward about his partner LaRusso killing a suspect in cold blood that could have worked amazingly for a power ballad type number as he vents out all his frustrations out about being put in this no-win situation, but they let that opportunity just fly right past. Instead, we get a pile of songs that feel like they were placed in to fill a quota about characters and topics that have zero to do with the ongoing narratives. Officers Gaines and Rose report to a domestic disturbance. Here's the physical abuse song. LaRusso's wife, who's only ever on screen for a couple of scenes, is being mistreated by her husband for working at a strip club. How about she sings about hating love before she's completely excised from the series? This stalker is violently obsessed with this one actress that is absolutely terrified of him. Let's have him sing about it. Don't stop me now. Despite being a musical, a significant number of songs don't propel the actual narrative or characters forward in any meaningful way, and rather act like a fart in an elevator, just lingering for a bit before we move on. Making it clear that whoever was doing the narrative writing and who was doing the composing weren't working on the same page. At any rate, they would write a script and then they would send me the script. And in certain parts, you know, they thought they knew where the songs ought to go. So they'd go, we should have a song here. And in some cases, I would agree. In some cases, I'd say, you're crazy. They're not going to sing there. You know, let's sing them here. You know, let's. And then we'd sit down with this squadron of songwriters and we'd go, okay, this is for you guys, this is for you guys, this is for you. And it was really fun. It was kind of like a, it was a, you know, assembly line for a Broadway musical, you know, very difficult, but. And it's not as if the songwriters on the crew weren't talented either, if not a bit overworked. As I've already alluded to, they even swindled Randy Newman in to create the theme song, which would have been the 90s equivalent of having Hans Zimmer composing for a Stadia commercial. Aside from coming on to do the theme, Randy also did the five songs used for the pilot, but after finishing that, he bounced, leaving the songwriting and composing to Mike Post and the rest of the music department, though not before swiping an Emmy on his way out. So with Newman gone, the music department was left to pump out five Broadway performances every week. And when you consider how much of a grueling task it is to even get your average theater production off the ground, and then having to do it weekly on a TV budget, it starts to make sense why it was a tough job for the crew. Fortunately, only a handful of the songs, approximately one every episode, had any choreography to go with it. But even without accounting for dance numbers, making that many show tunes in a season would make Steven Sondheim blush. What didn't help was how they decided to record the musical numbers, and prepare for every theater major listening right now to pop a blood vessel on this one. You see, typically with musical performances on television or film, what's done is to have a master track with the vocals recorded separately in a proper studio that the cast would then lip sync to during the actual filming, making it easier to record and edit together since recording on stages, sometimes outside, adds too many variables between the music and the filming itself, not to mention the cost of it all. Looking at you, Tom Hooper. Every single person is singing every take live. This has not been done with this kind of consistency in a musical before. Steven, however, wanted Cop Rock to have the live performance feel of Broadway, which would be admirable if it didn't make the production three times harder and the musical quality worse for it, because it meant that the actors had to sing live on set as it was being recorded, with the instrumental master track playing faintly off screen in the background for them to keep rhythm to. Which makes the fact so many of these songs turned out as well as they did that much more impressive. I can understand wanting to do the fundamental theater practice where a character's emotions boil up to the point where they can't speak and need to sing to express themselves, 
And it's possibly easier to execute that when they can segue right into it without going from speaking to pretend singing that will be layered over in post. However, not only is this making more work for literally everyone involved in the production, and the vocals objectively worse sounding, but the music numbers nearly always come in with the music leading them in. So it would be stupidly easy to just have dubbed everything in anyway. Why did you do it this way, Steven? Why did no one stop you? All right, so those are the issues with The Rock. What about The Cop? Now, I'm about 20 shades too white and a few latitudes too high to talk about the complicated history of racial tensions with the police in the US using any first-hand knowledge, which is unfortunate since that is a major focus of Cop Rock's narrative. So this is an explicit warning that if talking about these sort of topics bother you, you can skip to this timecode here for the wrap up because unfortunately, things are gonna get a little heavier. Other than Officer Vicky's marital issues, every major storyline of the season has an explicit racial theming to it. Whether it's Detective LaRusso murdering a black suspect accused of killing a cop that had already been apprehended, leading to a trial on his misconduct and how that gets spun for PR to move the jury, the way his partner Detective Potts is treated when he comes forward about what happened, eventually leading to him quitting, or Officer Rose having others in the force actually saying he can't be trusted as an officer because he's black. With the character singing the anthem for the statement, I'm not racist, but... Don't get me wrong. In fact, despite being a cop show in the 90s, Cop Rock doesn't entirely pull its punches with the systematic failings of the American police system. Whether it's the way some criminals abuse legal procedure to escape prosecution, to those in actual need not getting help and just being told to move along. On top of that, nearly every officer is framed as incredibly flawed individuals that frequently don't respect their power. LaRusso is introduced lying in court and is so violent he has a rap sheet. Potts looks the other way as his partner violently interrogates suspects and even attempts to cover up the murder he was a witness to until he's called out for it. Rose acts with aggression at the drop of a dime, and Captain John gave his kid a master system instead of a Nintendo Entertainment System. The only officer who remotely resembles the idealized image of a police officer is Detective Gaines, who is the most pure-hearted, egalitarian, gee willikers, I sure do love protecting and serving my community, type of officer in the entire show. To the point that it's portrayed as incredibly naive and annoying by literally every other character he interacts with. This is best highlighted by his new partner, Officer Rose, who has seemingly dealt with years of other officers on the force blatantly mistreating him for his race, and genuinely not trusting Gain's happy-go-lucky attitude because it's so foreign to him. And the main conceit to their story arc is Rose realizing that he is, in fact, that nice of a guy. Keep in mind that this was years before Crash taught white people about race issues. So for 1990, Cop Rock was decently ahead of its time for even broaching these themes. It's important to note that this was made months before the infamous video of Rodney King being assaulted by the LAPD was released, triggering a nationwide discussion regarding police violence. This more nuanced awareness of hot button issues is likely due in large part to the work put in by Stephen Bochco, as he was known for telling gritty police or legal narratives that didn't shy away from touch your subject matter of the time, and is often credited for heralding in the golden age of television like The Sopranos, there's even a brief subplot about a gay character almost being publicly outed against their will by a journalist who was doing a positive spotlight on gay people in city government, and the support he gets from his boss during that moment to keep them protected. Which for 1990s television is pretty forward thinking, even if they portray the character as being stereotypically camp while doing it. As I've already highlighted, if the music was better integrated so that it didn't so violently clash with these heavier political issues, like you just took a screwdriver shot after brushing your teeth, this show could have held up decently well. Mmm, except for maybe one bit, and this is where I have to talk about my favorite storyline, Police Chief Roger and Mayor Luis. Now, Roger Kendrick, the chief of police of the LAPD and the highest ranking officer of the entire main cast, is continually portrayed as a bumbling loser who doesn't care about his job, instead longing to be a root and tune cowboy, and his second in command, Commander Osborne, having to effectively babysit him through it all. 
Roger's first solo song in episode 3 is even a country number where he sings about how he misses the old west times where sheriffs could murder the bad guy, no trial necessary, as he rides a horse through the ghettos of LA. It's frankly way too much for me to unpack here, so we're just gonna move right past it. Meanwhile, Mayor Luis's storyline revolves around her plans to run as Senator of California, but her prosthetic nose and chin apparently make her so ugly that her campaign manager simply can't promote her, despite her being a seemingly popular mayor of Los Angeles. So in order to secure the election, she opts to get plastic surgery, which apparently was so drastic that Roger, who has known Luis for apparently years at this point, didn't recognize her while in her own office waiting to meet with her specifically. But after they go out to one event together, they somehow end up falling head over heels for each other, despite Roger's past bashings and using her image as target practice. Obviously this wouldn't be anything to roll your eyes at since it just paints the police chief as incredibly vain, but as it continues on, it makes Mayor Luis herself look progressively more incompetent that she lets him get away with multiple PR disasters as the chief of the LAPD, which could easily ruin her run for Senate. When in the second episode, she was so aggressively on his ass for even attempting to sweep the LaRusso case under the rug. Then during LaRusso's trial, Roger has a heated gamer moment where he tells the reporters that LaRusso's already been judged by the rich west side leftists, con merchants, I'm referring to the whole miserable entertainment industry that this city bends over backwards for, even though from what I can tell it's made up mostly of drug addicts, crybabies, and homosexuals who are intent on tearing down all our traditional American values. As this is happening, his black commander can clearly tell he's about to get ratioed and drags him away to the elevator. But not before Roger calls LaRusso's lawyer, One smart you. As the doors close. Credit to Vonnie Curtis Hall, who plays Commander Oz, because he nails that subtle stone dead expression of, I can't believe you just fucking said that. After all this, Roger is rightly called out by the mayor for offending at least three minority groups as chief of police, effectively making them both look terrible. And he attempts to hand wave it away that he wasn't trying to offend anyone. In response, the mayor is framed as being so romantically desperate for the first guy that apparently ever gave her attention that she ignores everything he just said and offers to keep sleeping with him after this. However, he plays the herd victim for getting his hand smacked and walks off. What later follows is Chief Rogers holding a press conference, the 90s equivalent of a twit longer, to address what he said in the past. And after the lightest amount of questioning from reporters, he has yet another heated moment that sounds Oddly 2020. And today is my 52nd birthday, damn it, and I am what I am. And what I am is an old cop who doesn't have time to sit around on his ass debating the pros and cons of law and order with a bunch of ignorant left wing media jackals. This continues to be the cycle of this story thread for the rest of the season. Chief Rogers does something incredibly stupid or has a public meltdown. Commander Oz and or Mayor Luis are incredibly patient with him as they address what he did as wrong as if he's a five-year-old. He continues with it regardless. It goes terrible. Repeat. That is, up until episode 10, no news is a good news, where Roger has an Ebenezer Scrooge moment of clarity about his racism. But instead of being visited by the three ghosts of Christmas, it's a dream about black people collectively putting him on trial and singing about how they're going to hang him for being a racist white man. Now what you thinking? What are you going through? Now that you're worse, dream is coming through. <laughs> yeah. Snap cut to him waking in a cold sweat, screaming for Ozzy. And they finally have a genuine moment about the issue. Do you really think I'm a racist, Ozzy? Well, what I think is, racism comes from fear. People are afraid of what they don't know. You don't know us, Chief. Despite the cartoonish scenes it takes to get here, this is what I actually appreciate about this plot thread. Going by what we're shown, Roger isn't exactly a villain or malicious antagonist within the narrative like he could be, but his opinions are never once treated as correct or having any real merit. He's a dumb old boomer who has absolutely zero awareness for the world around him beyond his narrow perception of it. 
resulting in him continually placing his foot firmly in his mouth that does get him in trouble by everyone around him. Roger is quite literally presented as someone so thoroughly stuck in the past that he is slowly being left behind. So this moment of self-reflection at least implies there's a beginning to a character arc forming here to expand on, even if it took this bizarre moment to get here. And I'm sure you're all dying to ask, so Fox, where does the racist police chief subplot go? Well, unfortunately, we'll never see where it or any of these plot threads were leading to. By episode 4, everyone knew the show was dead in the water. Ratings were tanking further each week, and because of how expensive it was to produce, ABC had to cut their losses. So, Cop Rock was cancelled halfway through the season, during the shooting of its 11th of 13 episodes. With how much money was already sunk into the production though, ABC chose to continue airing everything that had already been filmed as scheduled until they found a replacement for it, including what was being filmed at the time of the announcement. So the production crew was faced with a choice, either film the third to last episode exactly as planned and end off on a cliffhanger that would never get resolved, or go out with a bang. So as everything culminates in the last aired episode, it all concludes with a fourth wall shattering closing number where the entire cast and crew comes out for one final song, with a literal fat lady singing to send them off the air. Which, in retrospect, feels like a show of defiance when you know a bit more about what was going on behind the scenes. Before giving the axe, Bob Iger supposedly proposed that he'd be willing to let Cop Rock continue on, simply retooled and sans the musical numbers. But Steven refused. Aside from the fact that he cast everyone with their vocal range in mind over their acting, he was committed to his vision of the series and wasn't interested in changing it to keep it on air. So while it's easy to laugh at Bochco and the others involved for even attempting this and all the mistakes they made along the way, which I've been doing this entire video, in a way, I gotta give them credit for even trying. Ask any creative and they'll tell you that it's easy to play it safe and do what you know will perform well. It's terrifying to take a creative risk when you don't know how people will react. To do something that pushes the envelope or goes against common conventions. Even attempting to do something that isn't your usual style can feel intimidating because you know your audience might push you back. So after all the shit I've thrown at them, seeing everyone involved in Cop Rock go in knowing that this show wasn't likely to perform well because of how out there it was, but commit to it regardless, and clearly enjoy themselves while doing it, makes me sort of respect them for it. There was a nothing venture, nothing gained approach to it all that you just don't see all that often. As Bochco said in an interview in 2010, I'm really sorry it tanked the way that it did. It made me the butt of jokes, but I loved doing that show. It was one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had. All the way up until 2018, when Steven sadly passed away due to leukemia, he never relented his stance on Cop Rock. He knew it was a failure, but he never rejected it or expressed regret for attempting it, which would have been the simpler route to go. After being mocked and laughed at for years for it, he kept to his guns that he had fun making the show regardless of what others thought. And as a creator who constantly struggles with past mistakes and fears of messing up on anything they might do, I can't do anything but salute him for that. 